Gotcha. Good afternoon and happy holidays. I'm Andy Talkov, Senior Director for Curatorial Affairs at the Virginia Museum of History and Culture, and welcome to the this latest installment of Curators at Work. Uh, this is a regular series where our curators share stories about working with the museum's collections and offer some behind the scenes perspectives about the work that we do. Uh, this program is part of a vast library of online programs offered as part of our Virginia History at Home initiative. And if you haven't seen what we have to offer, you can go to virginiahistory.org slash at home to enjoy a curated selection of free digital resources that include podcasts and webinars, virtual tours, and, and hundreds of hours of recorded lectures. Um, so, as always, before we get started, I'd like to thank our members. None of the work that we do would be possible without their support. And because the VMHC does not receive state operating support, it's really through private donations that we're able to preserve and share Virginia's story and offer programs like this. So, just a reminder for those of you watching, uh, if you have any questions or comments, um, please leave them in the comment uh, bar and we'll do our best to discuss them as part of today's conversation. You don't have to hold your questions until the very end. So as you think of them, uh, just go ahead and ask. Um, so uh, I think it's you know worth mentioning that each year uh, the museum adds thousands of items to our 9 million object collection. Uh, many of these, uh, and in fact, most of the items in our collections uh, have been gifted to us by members of the public who have treasured items that they think would be of value to future generations in understanding Virginia's rich history uh, and the story of its people. And this has really been the case since uh, our organization was started back in 1831. Um, but in addition to gifts uh, and offers by the public, our curators are also very actively building the collection so that it can best represent um, all Virginians. Um, and, you know, you, as you would imagine, during the 189 years that we've been collecting, there are some not noticeable gaps uh, that we're actively trying to fill. Uh, particularly in relation to uh, the stories of people of color and uh, new immigrants uh, to Virginia, and even historical time periods. Um, like the collection becomes uh, much less robust uh, in the period after World War II. Um, and lastly, I'll say that, you know, another priority for us as we collect objects um, is that we want to be able to 
collect objects from current events from across the Commonwealth as they're happening. Certainly, it's much easier to capture history as it's happening than uh, for a historian 100 years from now to try to recapture objects from events that happen today. And so we're very active in trying to collect items related to the history of people today and our experiences so that future generations will be able to understand the times in which we live. And so um, after a very interesting year of collecting in 2020 um, and a, a very historic year with a, a major uh, general election, a presidential election, a summer marked by racial justice uh, uh, protests, and of course, a global pandemic. Uh, it's, it's been a very historic year and, and we've been actively trying to document that. And so I thought that it would be nice in this uh, last installment of this program for 2020 to have all of our curators participate um, and talk about our favorite gifts to the collection, uh, which I think um, is very fitting in this season of giving. So um, I am joined by my colleagues Paige Newman and Dr. Karen Sherry and Dr. William Rasmussen, all curators um, at the museum. And um, Today we're going to talk about some of our a few of our favorite things that have been added to the collection this year. So um, I'll let my colleague uh, Dr. Karen Sherry uh, kick us off today, uh, and I I uh, will uh, see you in a little bit. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, I echo my colleague Andy and welcoming you all to the program and and wishing you a happy holiday season. Um, as Andy said, my name is Karen Sherry. I'm one of the curators at the museum who works with the museum collection, um, uh, which is millions and millions of objects related to all aspects of Virginia history. And one of my favorite new acquisitions from the past year is this lovely bracelet, which was gifted to us by State Senator Ghazala Hashmi. Um, now, if you follow politics, you might recall that in um, uh, preceding year's election, the 2019 election, um, that was a momentous and historic election on several fronts. First of all, it was an election that resulted in turning Virginia's General Assembly from Republican to Democratic control uh, for the first time in a couple of decades. In addition, it was an election that witnessed a historic number of women gain legislative seats. And um, Senator Hashmi represents both of those waves, the kind of democratic wave and the, the pink wave, if you will, the wave of women entering the General Assembly. In addition, um, Senator Hashmi uh, represents an, a historic first in that she is the first Muslim American to hold a seat in Virginia's General Assembly. Um, so for all of those reasons, her story is one that we want represented in our collection. And we are very fortunate to be able to do so through the gift of this lovely bracelet. Um, this is a bracelet that had great personal significance to Senator Hashmi um, because it is inscribed with a Muslim saying that, um, uh, uh, an Arabic saying that Muslims utter when they were about, when they are about to embark on a new journey. And um, if I could have the next slide, please. Um, uh, I hope you can see in this slide, which represents the swearing in ceremony for new senators at the opening of the General Assembly's 2020 session, that Senator, new Senator Hashmi is wearing that bracelet um, uh, as a, um, an act of um, good luck as she embarks on her new journey as a senator. So, um, this is, uh, as I say, a really special piece to bring into the collection to help represent her story, a story um, which feels 
particularly re relevant after the 2020 election in which we have a vice president elect who represents many historic firsts. Um, uh, and I'm speaking of vice president elect Kamala Harris, who is the first woman to um, become vice president in our country and also the first woman of color. So um, I hope that we're able to um, put this bracelet on view for our visitors when um, when we open and uh, that you get to enjoy this and um, the historic story that it represents. And now I'll turn it over to my colleague Bill for one of his favorite new acquisitions. I'm going to show you um, four examples of art that we've been given um, during the past year. It's representative of the types of things that we're given. Mostly the art we receive is uh, their, their portraits. Um, wish we had more landscape paintings, but most of them are portraits. We have, we receive some furniture. And what all of it, all these objects have in common is that they've They've stayed in the family um, and passed down through the generations. So the four examples I'm going to show you, uh, one is now and uh, was in the owners in California. The owner of another one is in Boston. And the third one is in uh, is in Williamsburg. Um, and the fourth one is actually in Richmond, and and uh, which is what you're looking at now. It's, this is a major addition to the collection because it's John Randolph of Roanoke um, by Chester Harding, who's a significant painter. Uh, Roanoke is the name of his plantation in Charlotte County, and um, it was a huge gap in our collection not to have a good portrait of him. And this, the best I can tell, uh, this is one of the best portraits of him that 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 exists. Um, he was a, one of the most conspicuous figures of his of his period. Uh, that, that period was about 1800 to 1830. Um, he was a con in which he served in Congress most of those years. He would get uh, he would he would fail to be reelected every once in a while because he was so eccentric and offended so many people. He was a great orator with incredible wit. And if you were the subject of his attacks in in Congress on the floor of Congress, you 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 would be sorry. Um, he was precocious. At age 28, he was made chairman of the Tax Writing Committee, which is the House Ways and Means Committee, which is an important position. And he was the leader of his party, and he was Thomas Jefferson's spokesman in the new generation. Uh, but then after five years, he, he broke with Jefferson. He thought, he thought the principles had been diluted. They shared the same ideas that Jefferson had, that, that the country should be an agrarian society. Um, but he opposed nearly everybody, Jefferson, Madison, John Quincy Adams, Henry Clay. Um, he's a fascinating figure. He, he, he's fascinating even in, with respect to his feelings about slavery, because he thought that slavery was a necessity for a tobacco plantation. He thought it was just the normal way of life. Yet he was one of the ones at the end of his life, he famously freed his slaves and, and one of the greatest emancipations because he sent them to... Um, to Ohio with sufficient money to buy land and um, supplies. And they found it Rossville, Ohio. Uh, this portrait remained in the family. John Randolph did not marry, had no children, but his mother remarried when John Randolph's father died. And she married an, a famous person, uh, St. George Tucker. He was the famous William and Mary Law professor who wrote the 184 dissertation on slavery that proposed the gradual abolition of slavery. Of course, it never got anywhere. And then it passed down through the Tucker family. Um, and and that's, um, and, and it's from a member of the Tucker family that we received this portrait. So I will show you another one before we move on um, to, 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 a, to another, to one of my colleagues. This is a portrait of, Oh, as you see, a heady car. Uh, it's it's interesting for who she is. It's also interesting for its artistic merit, just like the last portrait I showed you. It's by Sarah Peel. She was a competent painter. It's probably painted in Baltimore, where um, Hetty Carr came from initially. Um, and uh, Peel, Sarah Peel, was one of the children of Charles Wilson Peel, one of those great. Amer American um, artist born in the 1740s. And he, he had a number of sons who he named Rubens Peel, Raphael Peel, Rembrandt Peel. They all were good painters, as was Sarah Peel. Hetty Carr's um, is, is famous 
for, for the wrong reason, for being the wife of Peter Carr. Uh, I don't think a portrait of Peter Carr exists. He died early, um, and um, I, I find no evidence of, of one. Um, but he was a significant figure in Virginia and American history uh, because he was the nephew of, of Thomas Jefferson. And his father died when he was three, and he, and he was sent to Monticello, and, and he was raised at Monticello. And defenders of Jefferson for decades attempted to pin on him the paternity of the children of the enslaved Sally Hemings until DNA proved that that wasn't the case. Um, well, I uh, can't blame him for that, but we can blame him for what, it, the way his, what his biographers described him as being self-indulgent, indulgent, corpulent, and extremely slothful. And one thing we can blame him for was that, well, there was a letter that, a famous letter that Jefferson wrote to a friend in Italy, Philip Mazzei, uh, in which he criticized George Washington. And that caused a breach between the two of them. And then after several years, that sort of died away. And then Carr on his own wrote to Washington again, resurrecting the scandal, and thereby triggered a final breach between Jefferson and Washington. Well, we can't blame his, his wife for that. Um, and um, But you can see why this portrait is worth having in our collection. I'll turn it over at this point, come back in a moment and show you two more examples. Hi all, I'm Paige and I work mainly with manuscripts. So what you're seeing is an image of a Bible. And I just want to briefly mention, we get a lot of questions about donation of Bibles. And we realize Bibles are important pieces um, for the family, but what's important for the historical record is the genealogical material inside. So I know it's times we might have offended people by not accepting their Bibles, but Bibles do take up a lot of room, which we don't have in our storage. So if we only ask for the genealogical material, it's because that's what's really important for us in the genealogical record. So one thing I was very excited about for accession this year is a donor contacted us to offer the Bible of William and Elizabeth Kennedy. And you can sort of see um, on the brown, on the um, slide that's brown, it says Family Bible of Elizabeth and, oh, excuse me, Elizabeth Park Mosby and William Kennedy. And so the donor found this Bible at an estate sale in DC. And she had done some research to see that we had a small collection of William Kennedy papers. And just to give you a little background, William Kennedy was a free African-American residing in Henrico County, Virginia before the Civil War. He worked as a mechanic and a carpenter, and after the war, he was active in the Mount Olive Baptist Church, helped establish the Sons of Jacob Mutual Aid Society, and the Republican Party running as a candidate for the House of Delegates in 1869. The collection is only about 33 items, and it dates from about 1853 to 1870. It includes accounts, correspondence, church minutes, and other materials related to the Sons of Jacob and the Republican Party, but not much when it comes to family and very little about his wife or children. So this is why I was really excited about this donation, because it helps us add some more pieces to um, William Kennedy's family and their story. So I already mentioned the inscription. If we can go to the next slide. The Bible you see family record and it lists um, the marriages and births. So if we go to the next slide, it provides a little inset to see that it shows us that William and Mary were married on April 2nd, 1843. This is not information we had before. And also throughout the diary, and the diary, excuse me, the diary ranges um, from, it notes births, deaths, and marriages from 1841 to 1952. So this Bible was kept in the family for a pretty long time. Um, they're also a not, you can't see in these slides, there's different handwriting and there are pages that have been added that duplicate um, information about deaths and births already written in the Bible. Another um, interesting fact we found is that William and Elizabeth had five daughters and one son, and all their birth dates are listed in there. Their youngest daughter, whose name Rosabel Hope Kennedy, 
her death is noted in there, as well as William's wife, Elizabeth. We did find out Elizabeth died in 1871. And what is written in there is that it's in her 47th year she died. So we can estimate that she was born around 1820, between 1824, 1826, maybe. And so this adds yet another important part of information. Their youngest daughter, Rosabelle, who was born in 1865, December 24th, actually. And then she died in, eight, I mean, excuse me, in 1914. And a note was written um, but after announcing her death that she died after a brief illness. And this was written about her. She left a legacy to her family, a good name, which is better than riches. She never married, but was a second mother to all her nephews and nieces. She enjoyed the respect and affection of the families with, for whom she worked and was deeply mourned and will never be forgotten by them. So this adds other important pieces of information that Rosabelle never married. She worked for a family. We're still trying to figure out more information and that she was actually well known, I'm guessing. And we do know that the family is from Henrico and what other information in the um, Bible mentions that most of the children were born in Henrico. So this is what excites me about, it's the story, the fact that these are papers that were donated a little while ago, and then just this year, another piece of the puzzle shows up. So that's just one little thing, and I can't wait to share with you the next thing as I turn this over to my colleague, Andy. Thanks, Paige. Um, so, uh, one of the most iconic images of World War II, and of course, there are a lot of iconic images of World War II, um, is an olive drab Curtis P 40 Warhawk, right? So, think of a fighter plane um, painted with a tiger shark's eyes and mouth, mouth on the nose, right? So, Anyone who sees that plane and knows anything about World War II, or if you've ever watched the History Channel, you probably recognize that as the iconic flying tiger uh, uh, plane. And so the flying tigers, of course, were the first American volunteer group of the Republic of China Air Force, and they served from 1941 to 1942. So this was a group of American um, Army Air Corpsmen. Navy and Marine Corps uh, men who um, all served with the Chinese really prior to the United States entry into, uh, into the Second World War in order to help the Chinese fight against the Japanese. Um, when America entered the war uh, by uh, being attacked at Pearl Harbor, in December 1941, um, the first combat operation of the Flying Tigers, these pilots, was actually 12 days after Pearl Harbor. Now, the Flying Tigers, that initial group, um, sort of ceased to exist as volunteers that reported to the Republic of China Air Force and ultimately were absorbed by the American Army Air Corps. Um, so, um, what I was surprised to learn is that it wasn't just P-40 Warhawks that um, were flying the skies over China and Japan that were associated with the Flying Tigers, that there was, in fact, uh, an entire bomber group or bomber groups associated with that organization as well. And so in this photograph here, which I've ident identified for uh, the person whose collection um, this photograph is a part of, Anthony generally referred to as Tony Dowd. Um, this is a photograph of him with his uh, B-24D um, uh, flight crew. And even as I was looking at this photograph today, I started to notice some of the markings that were on the plane, including what looks like a name, which is Boomerang 3. So, the, and there were more famous versions of a, a boomerang bomber 
but um, this was uh, Boomerang 3, apparently. And uh, Tony is located standing at the far, um, far right of the image. What I learned today, which was sort of interesting, is that the fellow standing at the far left, his uh, name is uh, Harold Filer. He was a second lieutenant. And on December 13th, 1944, when um, their plane was shot down, all of the crew members were able to evacuate the airplane and parachute to safety, um, including uh, Lieutenant Filer. And all of the crew members were found um, except for him. So this image took on a little more meaning today because in addition to being a great photo of Tony with his flight crew, um, uh, it also is a good record of, uh, of, of the pilot who did not return. Um, but I was just thrilled when I got an email from uh, Tony Dowd's grandson, Matthew Helm, who uh, gifted us this collection. And um, in, in addition to this photograph, there were other photographs of his grandfather. Here's a, a, a more portrait version of uh, Tony. So Tony was born in Brooklyn, New York in 1924. Um, but he grew up in Lunenburg County and graduated from St. Benedictine High School in Richmond. Um, he was drafted into the U.S. Army in 1943. And according to family uh, history, his mother withheld his draft notice until 24 hours before he was required to report for duty. Um, so that must have come as quite a quite a shock <laughs> for Tony. Um, but he did ultimately serve as a tail gunner on a B-24 bomber and flew 100 missions in the China-Burma-India theater with the 425th Bombardment Squadron. Um, so here in this photograph, you actually get a really good, group, uh, good look at the breast patch um, of the 425th Bomber Squadron. Um, and the 14th Air Force adopted the Flying Tiger designation from the American Volunteer Group of the Chinese Air Force. So you can't see it very well in this picture, but there is literally a flying tiger uh, on this large, this large patch that's on his, um, on his left breast. On his left shoulder is uh, the China-Burma-India theater patch, which started to be used um, uh, in 1942, but wasn't officially recognized till 1944. Um, so Tony had quite an interesting career in the, uh, with the Flying Tigers. He was forced to bail out of an aircraft twice, including uh, on the mission that was uh, flown by um, Lieutenant Filer. Um, and during a training uh, mission uh, he, or training exercise, he actually fell out of the plane once while attempting to manually extend the, the nose wheel. Um, it's interesting to note that when I talked to the family, you know, as a tail gunner, there, there wasn't an opportunity for him to actually wear a parachute while in flight. And so in the effort to bail out of the plane, there was quite a scramble to get the parachute onto his back so that he could eject from the plane. Now, I'm not sure from which mission this photograph is from, but here you'll see Tony safely on the ground uh, wearing his iconic flight jacket, the A2 jacket. And in his left hand, he is holding the ripcord from the parachute that he used to bail out of the airplane. Um, it's a remarkable picture. And uh, some of the other symbolism that you can see here. So we talked about the images on his left breast. On his right breast is, um, uh, 
is a stylized version of the insignia of the 14th Air Force. And I should mention that on the back of this jacket um, is painted a uh, what's generally referred to as a World War II blood chit. Um, he also had a blood chit inside the right breast um, inside the jacket too. So the blood chit here has the US flag as well as the Chinese flag. And it was intended to identify uh, pilots and soldiers who, if they were found by civilians, um, usually the message said something like, this foreign person has come to China to help the war effort. Soldiers and civilians, one and all, should rescue and protect and provide him medical care. Um, so that is what this particular blood chit says that's shown in this image. Um, the jacket that Tony wore is so amazing and so iconic. And what is really remarkable is that in addition to these photographs, um, uh, Matthew and his family had also been able to preserve the actual jacket that Tony is wearing in this photograph, which is also now part of the VMHC collection. Now, I don't have a good photograph of that because currently that jacket is uh, being studied for conservation so that we can ultimately have it on display. So um, I'll also mention that, you know, Tony came back from the war, survived the war, and he came back. And in 1953, he became the assistant manager of what was then known as Richard E. Byrd Flying Field. Um, now known as Richmond International Airport, and was instrumental over a number of decades um, in building that airport into the airport that we know um, today. Ultimately, he was the executive director of um, RIR in 1976. And then later in 1982, he was appointed to serve on the Virginia Aviation Board and served as its chairman until 1994. Um, Tony was inducted into the Virginia Aviation Hall of Fame, um, which is managed by the, by the Virginia Aeronautical Historical Society in 1996. And we have the award that he was given uh, when he earned that honor. Um, and Tony died uh, fairly recently on July 18, 2015, and is buried in Mount Cavalry Cemetery. Um, so the donation that Matt and his family made also included a number of items related to his service with RIR and as chairman of the Virginia Aviation Board. It's, it's such an incredible collection that tells a, the story of, of a really remarkable person at a remarkable time. Um, and so we're really looking forward to be able to sharing Tony's story um, here, but also in our museum galleries um, as soon as the jacket can be conserved. Um, before I turn the floor over to uh, my colleagues, I do wanna say one thing that the family told me is that given an entire lifetime of working around airplanes and in airplanes, um, it may not come as a surprise to you given his World War II experience that Tony absolutely hated to fly. So now I'll pass pass the baton um, on over to, to, uh, to my colleague, uh, Karen, again. Did. Hey, Karen, this is Andy. I just wanted to let you know that you're sorry. muted. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. I just realized that. I'm sorry, everyone. There's 
that my neighbor is doing construction. It's really noisy in my house, so I'd put myself on mute. Um, well, I am going to be talking to you now about one of the many items we have brought into our collection to represent events of this past year. What has been, as, as Andy noted at the very outset of this program, a momentous and historic year um, marked by the global coronavirus pandemic and also by the upsurge of social justice protests following the death of George Floyd at the hands of Minneapolis police on May 25th, 2020. And um, Richmond um, was a focal point of these protests. These protests, of course, um, uh, raged across the country, even around the world. Um, and Richmond was one of the, the major centers for um, social justice protests in the late spring and summer of, of this year. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and for th those of us here in Richmond um, who've been watching the protests, we've seen that there have been both, both peaceful and, and not so peaceful actions um, on the streets of Richmond. Um, groups um, organizing to um, uh, call for police reform, for racial justice, for changes to longstanding patterns of systemic racism um, in, in our city, in our commonwealth, in our country. Um, so um, the VMHC has been trying to collect items from these protests has been a bit challenging this summer because of um, uh, the pandemic and rules about social distancing and gathering crowds and so forth. It's also, um, there's an additional challenge in that a lot of the material culture associated with protests is by its very nature ephemeral. Things like a sign or a, a banner or a sticker, something that you might just carry for a particular march that day and then discard it at the end of the day. So oftentimes um, it can be difficult to uh, collect the um, uh, materials associated with these kinds of events because they are by their very nature intended to be ephemeral. But um, one of the items that we were able to collect, if I could have the next slide, please. It's, um, it's a somewhat, it's a small item. You can't tell from this slide, but um, this is a, a spent tear gas canister that measures about two and a half inches in diameter, the larger piece of it, um, which you see on the left. And um, it is kind of a, it's a small item, but it's nevertheless kind of a, a harrowing item because this um, underscores the, um, the, the chaos and um, uh, sometimes the danger of some of these protests. And it also crystallizes some of the ongoing debates about how uh, city authorities respond to um, these kinds of civic actions. Um, this particular protest, uh, excuse me, this particular item was part of the detritus found after um, Richmond police cleared out a peaceable protest on Monument Avenue by um, shooting rubber bullets and throwing tear gas canisters. And you can see in the photograph on the right, some of the, the chaos that um, followed as um, protesters who had assembled peacefully, who had the proper uh, permits and so forth to be there. Um, uh, they're um, starting to evacuate the area um, as, as the tear gas overtakes them. Um, and this was an event that prompted a huge outcry in the city um, and um, prompted Mayor LeVar Stoney to, um, to meet with protesters the following day, both on Monument Avenue and in front of City Hall. And it has prompted um, the authorities to also consider the types of techniques that uh, police uh, use in responding to acts of um, civic protest and civil unrest. And those debates are, are ongoing um, in, in, our, in our society. So um, uh, this um, exploded tear gas canister, um, as I say, it is evidence of um, these events that have been 
part of a broader national reckoning with issues of race and racial injustice that our society is, is facing today. So um, after that, I will turn it over to my colleague for the next item. I'm going to show you um, two more examples of the type of art that we've received over the past year, two, two, two pairs of portraits. And these are by self-taught artists as opposed to the high, more high style art uh, paintings that I showed you a little earlier. Um, but they're very good. Um, they have sort of folksy quality. So these self-taught artists can be just as good as the, um, as the, the, the high, high art, the well-trained uh, painters. These two sitters, uh, well, as you see, George and Elizabeth Fitzgerald, uh, they lived in Nottoway County, um, and which is, as you know, is southwest of, in, of Richmond um, in Piedmont. Um, they are, they, we, we know a lot about them because they, the portraits have stayed in the, the family. The donor in, in Boston has told us that their plantation was named Aspen Circle. Uh, it's a beautiful part of the, of the state, the landscape in Nottoway County. And, and they had, I think, like a half dozen sons who all ended up in the Confederate cavalry. So there's some research to be done there to figure out what happened with them. But it, this is all part of history. The war obviously affected uh, most families in, in a major way. Um, and this, is a, uh, this gives us a different perspective in which to view that sort of thing. What's particularly interesting um, to me about these portraits is the artist, um, uh, George Fitz Wilson. Um, I'd never heard of him. I, I don't think many people in Virginia who've studied Virginia art have ever heard of him, um, mainly because he worked more, I think, in North Carolina. And then after the war, he moved to the Civil War, he moved to New Orleans. Um, but he was very good. He was quite competent. And so we've, we've learned something about the story of Virginia um, art in the 19th century by with with the gift of these of, of these um, portraits and it's interesting with these names Fitzgerald and Fitz Wilson they all they are, they have both have strong Scottish backgrounds they must have had had a, there must have be some story there but as the as the uh, decision as to who to paint the portraits was made and then I have another pair a second pair of, of portraits by another self-taught artist um, Samuel T Taylor now we know a little bit about him because we own four portraits in our collection by him, um, and uh, but they're all in, in 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 they're in need of conservation. These these two at least are are in in, in good condition. Um, these um, these these two sitters were from Prince George, excuse me, Prince Edward County, and they have descended in the family to the donors uh, the donor in Williamsburg today. And what is um, amazing is that I, I don't believe a, a word has been ever written about Samuel T. Taylor. And the only way we're ever gonna figure out uh, information about his career is by gathering portraits like these um, and studying them. So um, these are a welcome addition to our, our collection as well. I turn it over back to one of my colleagues um, I don't remember which colleague it is right now. <laughs> it's back to it's me. Back to Andy. All right, thank. Um, well, thanks, Bill. So, uh, sometimes uh, you know a lot of the items that we've been talking about today have been offered to us um, uh, as donations, and as I said, most of our collection is made up of items uh, like that. Um, occasionally, um, we become aware of items that are available for purchase, um, and particularly when they fulfill our goals of better representing um, uh, people of color and underrepresented communities, uh, historical events that that we may not have well documented. Um, we usually try to jump on the opportunity. And so recently, something that we were able to add to the collection is um, this discharge uh, 
paper from the American Civil War um, that was issued to Private Joseph Blair. Um, so what's interesting about Joseph Blair is that Joseph Blair served in um, the 36th United States Colored Infantry. Um, many of you may know that um, at more than 180,000 African Americans served in the U.S. Army during during the Civil War, um, and they represented one, nearly one in every 10 Union soldiers. Um, and it was really uh, when uh, official enlistment of black soldiers uh, came in 1863, following uh, immediately on the heels of the Emancipation Proclamation coming into effect. Um, uh, there was a there was a large influx of of manpower um, from the black community. Now, anyone familiar with the movie Glory is um, you know likely knows the fifty fourth Massachusetts Infantry, um, which was largely raised from the northern states, but but most of the United States colored troops were actually raised from. Uh, the southern states uh, from um, uh, from populations of uh, formerly enslaved uh, men as well as uh, free black men uh, from from the south. Um, Joseph Blair, uh, we believe, was was not enslaved. He was a native of um, Essex County, Virginia. Um, and we do not believe that he was uh, enslaved, at least um, when he enlisted, um, because it, we haven't been able to find him um, uh, in the 1860 census as being listed in that way. Um, but this document um, just tells us so much about a person who otherwise, um, you know, may have been lost to history. It tells us that um, when he enlisted, which was on June 18th, 1864, um, it tells us that he was discharged on the 28th day, and you can see here, on the 28th day of October, 1866. So the war had been, uh, uh, you know, Lee's army surrendered in April of 1865. So long after the surrender of Lee's army and the surrenders of the principal armies of the Confederacy, the capture of Jefferson Davis, um, you know, Joseph Blair was still engaged in the service. Um, he was stationed in Brazos, uh, Santiago, Texas, and was likely there. Um, to protect the, the U.S. border with Mexico. Um, it also tells us that um, he was five and three and a half inches tall. He was 25 years old. He had dark complexion, dark eyes, dark hair, and had been a farmer um, in his previous occupation when he enlisted. And actually, he went back to Essex County after the war and was. Um, and continued to be a farmer for the, the rest of his life. Um, as far as, you know, his service during the war, the 36th U.S. Colored Infantry um, uh, was attached primarily to U.S. forces in Norfolk and Portsmouth as part of the Department of Virginia and North Carolina. Um, and primarily they were used um, for labor and for guarding Confederate prisoners. Um, however, the unit then uh, became a part of the operations against Petersburg and Richmond in 1864 and 1865. And um, Blair participated in an incredibly significant battle uh, in both uh, Civil War history as well as in um, Black military history. On September 29th, 1864, um, the 36th uh, uh, 
uh, regiment was involved at a battle outside of Richmond, uh, north of the James River, um, called the Battle of Newmarket Heights or the Battle of Chafin's Farm. And this battle becomes uh, well known because of not only the large number of African American soldiers that participated, um, but because of its particular brutality. Um, the the Black regiments assaulted the Confederate lines that were defending the roads to Richmond um, uh, in fairly heavy numbers and at a very good position at the outset of the battle. The 36th Infantry went in in the second wave of attacks after the first wave had stalled. And um, the brigade commander uh, that oversaw the 36th Regiment wrote that after passing about 300 yards through young pines, always under fire, we emerged upon the open plain about 800 yards from the enemy's works. He wrote, within 20 or 30 yards of the rebel line, we found a swamp which broke the charge. Our men were falling by scores. All the officers were striving to con constantly get the men moving forward. And their efforts and the efforts of the non-commissioned officers uh, in these black regiments who were African-Americans um, were ultimately able to get the charge moving and they overtook the Confederate lines. Um, and the reason that this battle is incredibly significant in black military history is not only because of the large number of casualties. I mean, in a battle that lasted 80 minutes, there were um, more than a, 130 men killed, um, 666 men wounded, and 45 men missing. Um, but because 14 black soldiers that day earned the nation's highest military honor, which is the medal, the medal of honor, um, Joseph Blair was not one of those men, but that battle uh, and its significance in black military history really makes the service of Joseph Blair very significant. So, you know, this dis these discharge documents have just so much information that they can tell about um, individual service um, and individuals that might otherwise have been lost. And so we were very excited to be able to add Joseph Blair's um, story to the collection uh, at the Virginia Museum of History and Culture this year. Um, so now I'm gonna turn the uh, floor over to Paige for our last installment um, and we'll end on a high note. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. So yes, the high note is the Yippie flag. So let's head back to the summer of 1970 and it's Honor America Day. Honor America Day was staged by supporters of President Richard Nixon on July 4th and held on the grounds of the Washington Monument and drew an estimated of 50,000 people. The day was intended to be nonpartisan, but was inter interpreted by many as a pro-war rally after student strikes protesting the students killed at Kent State and Jackson State University during anti-war protests. So sponsors of the event include Bob Hope as co-chair and Billy Graham as a keynote address. Other performers included Lawrence Welk, Jack Benny, and Glenn Campbell. The Youth International Party is a pro-cannabis and anti-war party, but also known as the Yippies. And this flag represents the Yippies. They staged a counter-protest to to honor America Day by holding a smoke in. And as the inset of the photo, you see people um, wading in the reflection pool. But this protest was to demanding legalization of marijuana and the end of the war. The donor also mentioned that in addition to witnessing, he was there for this day and witnessing uh, people wading in the pool, but also that um, police eventually shot tear gas at the crowd but the wind changed and the course of the tear gas ended up getting back in the police spaces and those that weren't part of this counter protest. So as I mentioned, the donor attended the smoke in, but it wasn't until after he, um, after that he was given the flag. One of his neighbors in his apartment building was a student at BCU or Virginia Commonwealth University had also attended the smoke in. 
and was a yippie from New York and ended up giving the slag to the um, donor. And now we have it in our collection. So it's, it's definitely, it's wonderful. Andy mentioned a little earlier that a lot of our items and what's represented our collection aren't, you know, before World War II or even closer to like Civil War, World War One, But the this yippee flag just kind of brings us into, you know, current times, you know, it's still 20th century, but current times and just adds another element to what the history that's represented our collection. And on to end it on the note, um, I feel that a lot of our donations and the stories of how the materials were received or passed down to our donors really match the stories of the materials themselves. So it's just and it, one great thing about being a curator at the VMHC. So I will now pass it back over to the other curators. Well, thanks, Paige. Um, so before we go to your questions, and I see um, a couple of comments in the chat, so feel free to add um, more comments. But um, I think if anything else is clear from our conversation today, it's that our collection is largely built based on um, on the things that you all have uh, in your homes. Um, and so if you are interested in donating to our collection, um, you know, we collect uh, uh, rare books, uh, manuscripts, diaries, letters, portraits, um, items that people may have gathered when they were part of events like the Yippie flag or the tear gas canister. Um, you know, we collect items related to your family's history. Um, and gosh, it just seems like over the last year, so many people have dived into their attics and basements and uh, their own family archives, um, you know, uh, in order to clean house a little bit since they may have had some time uh, over the last year to do that. But, um, but you know, that's, that's how our collection is largely built, is through you all telling us what you have that represents Virginia history. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be uh, an item related to a famous Virginian because we're really trying in our collection does represent, um, you know, both the, the uh, famous uh, as well as, uh, you know, people who just lived their everyday lives, which is that, you know, how people do that is important for future historians too. So um, that's my pitch. Um, <laughs> if you're interested in donating to the collection, you can go to our website. The link is here and it's also going to be in the show notes so that you can just click on it. It'll take you to a very brief form that gives you an opportunity to tell us what it is that you have. And then, um, you know, one of our curators will get back in touch with you about the item um, and tell you a little bit more about how we do ultimately decide what we accept into our collection. Because as my colleague said, um, you know, we don't have infinite space. And so we have to make, you know, very, um, uh, you know, very careful decisions about the things that that we're going to protect for future generations. I mean, we're in the forever business. So, um, so please let us know if you have things that you would like to donate. Um, and at this time, we can start to look at some of your questions. Um, so, uh, one. Uh, so, uh, I want to thank. Um, uh, Ms. Miller and Ms. Reimer for their, their encouragement. I'm glad that you're enjoying the program. Um, Ms. Bernstein asked if uh, we'd made any effort to contact the descendants of the pilot who was uh, not found. Um, so I will say that uh, I did just discover that connection this morning, um, but also, um, I found that information online at a site that described that person's life and had a number of other photos of, of him, including the photo 
that was donated to our collection. So I think they are aware of that photograph, um, uh, you know, existing. And you're right, it's incredibly powerful to, to see an image. I'm not exactly sure which flight that photo was taken before. I mean, it could have been taken at almost any time, but it sure is, you know, one of the last photos that uh, would have been taken of him in life. Um, and so you also asked or suggested that the concrete barriers around the Lee Circle would make great items for our collection. Um, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, and so um, I contacted, uh, I contacted uh, the state um, not that long ago. Uh, about what the fate of those barriers was was going to be, and and I was told by um, the Department of General Services that they did not have any particular plans for what was going to happen with those, but that those do not belong to the state. The state actually rented those, um, uh, you know, in order to to protect both the people that were in Lee Circle. Um, uh, as well as to protect the monument. Um, but after a little investigation, and I don't know if you know this, but a, a Jersey barrier um, generally weighs 8,000 pounds. Um, and so as much as we would love to add that to our collection, um, all of the items that we currently have in our collection are stored in the building that you see uh, when you go, when you uh, come to the corner of Arthur Ashe Boulevard and uh, and Kensington Avenue, um, so storage is at a premium, and the Jersey barrier is not small. But there are also complications associated with moving um, a four-ton Jersey barrier, you know, into storage or even into an exhibit. Um, none of the floors, as far as I'm aware, in our building will actually allow us to support an object that heavy. Um, so I'm not saying it's impossible, but I'm saying that we have looked into it and it is complicated for sure. Um, but they they are just an incredible, um, I mean, I see them very similarly to pieces of the Berlin Wall. I mean, they are just very, they're artistically beautiful. They represent an incredibly important time in the history of the state, our commonwealth, the nation. Um, and, you know, we're always, we are looking, as Karen suggested, at, at any number of ways that we can continue to, um, you know, to, to represent the events, um, you know, in the time that, that we live. Um, so I don't see any other questions right now. We'll give people another minute or so. In the meantime, maybe I should ask my colleagues if there's something that we didn't talk about today uh, that you thought was really, really wonderful that was added to the collection. That's a tough question because it's, you know it's almost like asking a parent to choose a, a favorite child, but. Um, we recently brought into the collection a wonderful quilt that was made by um, a woman uh, living in Yorktown, made for the Yorktown Centennial. And um, Andy will remember more details about this because he um, shepherded the acquisition into our collection. But it's um, the quilt features quilted panels showing the flags of all 50 states. And um, it's such a remarkable object. It was featured in an issue of National Geographic magazine around the time. And Andy, I don't know if you want to add some other details about, about that Yorktown centennial. Oh, sure. Andy, Andy I'll add that um, <laughs> first we should go back and look at 2019 and other years too. This is the first time we've done this. It's a very interesting <laughs> exercise. But we, we received some really stunning things um, in 2019. Um, 
including one group of portraits that's appraised at a million dollars. So there, there's we've been we've been receiving a lot of interesting things. So perhaps on a future broadcast we can dig back a little before 2020. <laughs> Maybe that'll be the subject of a future a future yeah. episode. <laughs> um, yeah, and the only other thing I'll say about that that quilt um, is that. Um, is is that it was actually featured in an in an issue of National Geographic um, uh, in in that year. Um, so and it was recognized by the president of the United States. Uh, so there's a letter um, uh, from the uh, president um, congratulating uh, the maker on um, you know being highly recognized for this really amazing you know, piece of piece of work. Um, she also won the state fair and the Prince William County Fair with that quilt. So it's, it's quite an amazing quilt. Um, One thing I'll jump in and mention, um, you know, we we realize that we're probably wetting your appetites to see these objects. And um, uh, because we have nine, nine million plus objects in our collection, we of course can't show everything at the same at once. Also, um, many items are sensitive to light, so we have to restrict when we can display them, how we can display them, for how long we can display them. Um, that said, we, we are moving to put as much of our collection as possible online, so um, hopefully once we get this quilt documented with proper photography and assess its um, condition and any needs for conservation, you can at least view it online, if not in our galleries. Yeah. Well, I think we've gone um, we've gone over our time um, <laughs> today because there's just so much exciting things to talk about. I mean, you know, we just love telling stories about the items in our collection and, um, you know, and if you go back to some of our earlier issues or earlier editions of this program, you'll see other items that have come in in 2020 as well. Um, so nice, some nice collections highlights. Um, so uh, I wanna thank everyone for joining us today. Um, you can look for an announcement about our next Curators at Work program, which is going to be on January 8th, 2021. Um, and I'll just also mention that um, our curators, uh, well, first I'd like to thank our, my, my colleagues, uh, Karen Sherry, Bill Rasmussen, uh, Paige Newman for joining me on, on this program today. Um, but uh, all of us uh, also do another program called Curator Conversations, um, which are a little more intimate and are only offered for our members. And so if you're looking for a great gift to give yourself or your friends and family um, this holiday season, I think you should give them the gift of membership. And that way you can join us every month for a program about the amazing things that are in our collections. And you can find out more about joining the VMHC on our website. So until uh, next month, uh, when we see you again, I hope that you stay safe and have a healthy and happy holiday season. Yeah. Thank you all.